Oh God. So it is eight o'clock in Moscow when Nina Khrushcheva is our guest tonight for Philoxenia, which I am moderating here from London, where it is five o'clock. It is six o'clock in Vienna. And we are in the middle of a very exciting week for Russian contemporary politics. We are talking tonight about the Russian roulette that is currently happening between the opposition leader Alexei Navalny and the Russian president Vladimir Putin. Our guest is Nina Khrushcheva, who is also a curator at Kreisky Forum. But she's uh, usually, when she's not in Moscow, living in New York. She's a professor at the New School in New York. She has been an expert on um, Russian politics for many years and is currently, we're quite lucky actually to have her booked for this slot tonight because she's going from Christian Amanpour CNN programs to Al Jazeera and back and forth in all sorts of Western and Eastern media. So um, a very, very big welcome to you, Nina, first of all, to uh, Kreisky Fong on to this talk tonight. Thank you, Tessa. It's my pleasure. And of course, Kreisky Forum would always be my first priority. Thank you. It's very nice of you to say. So let's maybe just start with a quite personal look um, how the situation for you is now in Moscow. If you look at the streets, if you go for a walk, do we have, do we have to imagine a um, city in an unrestful atmosphere or is business as usual as long as the police and the demonstrations are not going on? If there is no demonstration going on, the streets are generally open, but there is certainly a heavier presence of police. Um, though to say heavier presence is to say little because Russia does have a lot of police presence. It's essentially sort of, you always feel like it's a police state. So if something, something is to come up, the police would be immediately available to uh, control it. There's certainly more, but um, unless there is an announcement made and then it, of course, uh, you know, social media is being blacked uh, with the announcement, the news, uh, um, uh, be very careful reporting. For example, when the protests were happening on January 31st on Sunday, it was very difficult to find out what time and where, just because they would be reporting that people are gathering, but you cannot really say where because uh, the uh, the news site would be shot because it would be accused of uh, promoting demonstration. Generally, um, the center is open, although I think the Red Square has been closed for quite a few days just in case. I expect that would be uh, more demonstrations this weekend is gonna be incredibly cold, but more demonstrations this weekend. But so far, we really don't have any details um, as of yet, but there is a lot of, there is a sense of crisis. There is a lot of uh, sense of not insecurity, but a little bit of a um, kind of, as you said, the Russian roulette, the, um, this, the standoff between, uh, between the protesters. And I wouldn't even say the, you know, pro Navalny supporters because it really now uh, kind of the Putin fatigue playing more than anything. Uh, so the, those who are tired of Putin and, uh, and uh, want him out and those who are uh, one of, you know, the police and, and uh, National Guard people who are going to defend the state at any cost. I read that some people are still sitting in the, in the coffee shops and restaurants and watch the protest through the glass windows. So how can we imagine this situation? How do people decide if they go out? You say people are fatigued of Putin, so this must not necessarily be people who are politically active normally. Are they joining these demonstrations? Well, actually it's, um, I don't know where it happened because I mean, I guess it could have happened in, in the 31st because since the, the center of the city was completely closed. In fact, I spent two and a half hours actually trying to find where the protests are. Uh, because my phone was jammed. I mean, the internet signal was jammed, so I couldn't find out for a long time. Uh, so you could be sitting in the center for uh, at the kind of watching the protest, but it could have happened when the protest actually took place 
elsewhere, not where it was supposed to be, that is in the square next to the um, KGB, now FSB, the Federal Security Forces Building. Uh, then uh, before the protest happened at the place that it did, people would be sitting in coffee shops, drinking coffee and watching it from the street. But neither on the 23rd, um, it was somewhat difficult, but on the 31st, it would really not be possible at all uh, just to be there in order to watch the protest. I mean, if you happen to be in a place, you could, but other than that, you wouldn't be able to. Uh, but yes, I mean, I myself was a kind of a witness to this, not this year, but I think a year ago, uh, it was a protest in another very um, kind of well-known protest place next to the central market and there's a wonderful bar and restaurant there so people were watching uh, were sitting there drinking their beer or their cocktails and say careful careful don't step on me they would say to the protesters that police is dragging from uh from that particular place so yes that happens once in a while but are people being drawn into the protests from from the kind of normal middle class as it happened 10 years ago when the last big protests when navalny was beginning to be the leader um, where, the, where the middle class suddenly went to the street, where young bankers and young, young lawyers came out. And, uh, and it wasn't defined anymore that you had to be a political activist to go to an anti-Putin demonstration. Is this happening now? I think it happens more than probably almost ever is because I think about 50% of people who went out to the first protest on January 23rd were the ones saying, that they were never political, they never thought of it before, uh, but um, uh, kind of their view, especially young people is saying, I was born under Putin, I don't want to die under Putin. And so that was a uh, driving force in many ways. But I also think that the way the state has handled the whole Navalny case, and we can discuss why it did uh, the way it did it uh, with, uh, with such a sort of absurd show on force and, and illegality in many ways, uh, was even people who were who didn't really care much about Navalny uh, and thought that he himself was a show off and he's not fighting Putin's corruption, but he's putting he's fighting the way next to Putin as a politician. And so that may have turned some people away. But the way he was treated, the way the, uh, you know, the, as you know, when he returned on the January 17th, they switched the airports, they arrested people just because people were there. Uh, preemptively, then they uh, took him to police immediately. Then the trial happened the next day, or the pre trial happened the next day, and it happened in a police station, which is even in Russia, which is not particularly a very legal society, but it's unheard of. I mean, it's a trial. It, and in fact, Russia since the 1990s never had this kind of trial unless, um, you know, the trial that, um, that um, um, happens outside of the uh, court system, unless, of course, all of this is politically made up. And for that, also people went out. They were just incensed and outraged that they couldn't even pretend that Russia is a state where legal um, you know, kind of conformity where legal decorum matters. Before we come to the question how the state treats um, Navalny, I wonder, so if, if we look ahead and you see there are uh, demonstrations planned for Saturday, how much are these demonstrations now organized by the Navalny movement and how much is it, are people just going out because they want to go out and protest? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't think the 23rd, for example, the two weeks ago was organized. I mean, there was a call to to go and, and uh, protest against Navalny treatment, against the, the fact that Putin has been forever and whatnot. But a lot of people just go out because it is the thing to do. And we also have to remember, which to some degree is relevant to Russia, to some degree, I guess it's relevant to the whole world. A lot of the world have been seeing protests in the last year, right? In the last six months for sure. So a lot of it is also COVID protests is that people are uh, uncertain about their future. They, um, um, they, are, they have a lot of um, untapped energy. So people probably do go out if they, um, uh, more than they would have otherwise. That's not to say that they would not have gone out in Russia. It's hard to 
organize those protests right now. It really is because you don't know where and how it happened. For example, on the 31st, when I was walking around looking for a protest, a lot of people were like me. So if we say, ultimately, there was a protest held in um, a place called uh, uh, the, the square of uh, three um, uh, three train stations, three Vagzala. Uh, so that that Leningradske uh, Then when it happened, say I don't know, eight thousand people. Let's just say that that number. But I would imagine there were also thousands were walking around like me who were trying to get through those uh, through those police um, uh, uh, poli po police uh, cordons and and couldn't get through. So. So I think that on Saturday it would probably be the same thing. And the more, and also it, it's also going to happen after the Navalny uh, trial, final trial, which happened, what, two days ago on the second, where scores of people were arrested again, uh, scores of people were detained. But also now we, um, to the information is coming out that so many people were arrested and they cannot be processed by um, uh, by those detention centers. So they're yeah. sitting in cold buses uh, without food, without water. So this is an absolute human rights violation. Yeah. Um, and so people are getting, uh, it's like a domino effect. So people are now not only gonna to go to Navalny, but because somebody they know is sitting was sitting in that cold bus. So why did the Russian uh, regime, let's call it like that, uh, overreact? to this entire situation. I mean, overreaction is, is a wrong term if you think they tried to actually kill him by poisoning him with a nerve agent. I mean, we are, we are talking sort of serious and open crimes against uh, a, cit a citizen of their own state, uh, an open uh, show of a, a show trial where everyone can see completely openly that it's a politicized trumped up uh, court uh, case. And the verdict is uh, beyond anything that people should get for jumping bail while they are in a coma. I mean, it is just so outrageous. Why do you think does the regime feel so provoked by Navalny? And it is kind of a remarkable, I mean, this is excellent question exactly. I mean, I, I don't know. It's uh, because the trial when um, I actually was trying to get to the trial, of course, I couldn't uh, precisely because I couldn't get through that police and I'm, you know, I'm not a hero. I'm not going to fight them. Uh, so I couldn't get through. But it was, you're watching it. It is it's show trials of 1937, the great purges when they would be insane charges and, you know, people would say, yes, I did this. I don't know, you know, try to cut through the earth in order to get to Australia and do something. It was just absolutely that, uh, that ridiculous. Of course, Navalny was not, uh, was not a, a willing participant of all this. So he actually gave a very passionate speech saying, you know, you're not going to be threatened and they, uh, they want to imprison me. So you would be terrified and, and, and whatnot. I think, I mean, it, it, this is a very long conversation. So I try to be as brief as I can to, to explain it. I think uh, with probably COVID, probably Putin has been around for 20 years, which really does something to someone's psyche, especially sitting in the Kremlin for that long. Um, I think that uh, it's no longer even a Putin state in that sense. I mean, Putin is a symbol of the state. Uh, but where, as we see uh, Putin was dealing with COVID, it was outsourcing to anything, you know, the governor, the mayor, the, uh, the health department, the institute that creates the vaccine and so and so on. So once in a while he would show up and so Navalny refers to him, this old man in a bunker. So he would show up in cyberspace and says something. Uh, it was actually interesting after Navalny's, um, uh, after Navalny return and a few uh, investigations, especially the Putin palace investigation, um, uh, you know, that documentary about uh, an alleged alleged Putin palace in Gelenjik and in, in the south of Russia on the Black Sea. Suddenly I'm watching the news and I'm seeing Putin who is in physical presence uh, opening something one or another, one road or another. So he's like, oh, I guess it good to him. So he wanted to show he actually is a live person. It's not just from a bunker that, uh, that he's speaking. But generally, I think in many ways, I think we're dealing with a collective Putin. Putin is a symbol of the state. And I think the response is that if Navalny is, uh, is critical of that Putin, and Putin is a symbol of the state, as always the czars have been symbols of, 
of the state. So Navalny threatens the state. He's not just threatening Putin. So the dealing with Navalny, and that's why I guess it's so insane and stupid and forceful and um, uh, completely absurd, but at the same time, um, uh, very un unapologetic, is that it is the state responding for uh, to uh, Navalny, um, uh, Navalny attacking that collective Putin, hence attacking the state. And so, of course, there's always defending the state. Who? What do we have? And we have it in every state, not just in Russia. You know, you have your security forces in full force going out and basically slaughtering anybody who is a threat to your state. And I think that, for me, that is. I mean, there are other things we can put in, but just sort of. Um, uh, that is part of the explanation as to why uh, I think the response is such a, you know, some of the people that I talk to or kind of analysts or whatever analyst means nowadays, they say, oh, just Putin went completely mad. He's terrified of Navalny. He's embarrassed. He's this, he's that. So he's not forgiving. Maybe that's true. But I think it's more of a state apparatus fighting Navalny, who now is not just a local opposition leader, he's a global celebrity. He's a global case against Putin. And so, um, um, as I kind of once put it, uh, it's not entirely original to this today's forum, I already said it somewhere and I still stand by it, is that it's collective Putin defending itself from a global Navalny. Hmm. I thought it was also, you said, um in another interview a few days ago, that uh, what Navalny managed to do is that people in the West and in Russia now believe him more than they believe the Russian president. And I think that makes a big difference uh, in the way also the population in Russia probably slowly wakes up to the fact that uh, there, there might be an alternative, or is that too early to say? No, I think, I mean, the Russian, you know, in 2012 already when Putin returned for his third term after having a stint as prime minister, uh, people went out in force uh, to the streets and for a long time, for a number of years, in fact, they were protests and very forceful protests. So it was already then that people did not want the return of uh, the return of Putin. So it's not that they're waking up, but it's just, you know, when you have... Uh, such a vertical state that Russia always is. So the Tsar on top and then the rest happens uh, happens elsewhere. There's a lot of, and also it's a very big country. I mean, we've talked about this in this forum, 11 time zones. It's hard to put it together and kind of force them into, uh, into action in many ways. So I think what Navalny this did, did this time, he crystallized. It's not even that there is an alternative but that there is a need for an, for, for an alternative. I mean, Russia is a kind of, it's a cult, country of culture. I mean, instead of politics, we often have, there's all this cultural myth and, 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 and formulas. And so Navalny is a hero. I mean, I teach in America, so there was, they, they're always looking for a Captain America. And so he is, he is the Russian folk hero from a fairy tale. So he returned despite all the, all the threats at him and, the, and he's tall and he's charismatic and he's good looking and he's in love with his wife and he draws you know, hearts and, uh, on a window and it's all kind of an adorable political personal story. And look at Putin, he's, uh, his you know, face that you can't see through in opaque eyes and he's short and he's um, you know, in a bunker and whatnot. And so, I mean, we do think, unfortunately, we all do in this sense, we all live in an American world because now we all see um, even our own life through kind of those uh, cultural symbols and metaphors. Uh, and um, I think in this sense, Navalny is a very appealing character to say that um, this, now he's a politician on par with Putin. And that, once again, I go back to my, collective Putin versus a global Navalny. But also this is very convenient for the Russian state in many ways. And we go back to why they push so hard because if he is a Western plot, if it is a Western plot, if Navalny is a Western plot, which they've been saying to, to undermine Russia, then you can do anything to fight it back. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do, you can break all the laws, any laws, because it's, we are defending our national statehood. And if you listen to Sergei Lavrov, uh, who is the foreign minister, foreign minister. Or, right, of the Russian Federation 
also. Pardon me? He's also forever already the foreign minister. Right, forever the foreign minister. Uh, and uh, listen to the spokeswoman for the for the state of, not the state of Iowa, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They say, oh, it's a global plot because look, uh, every single foreign government says the same. So they all basically received a, uh, received a letter how to speak about this. And all these foreign diplomats came to Navalny's defense at, in, at, uh, in the court. Who does that? You only go to defend your own diplomat, your own person. But if you come to somebody else, that must be a plot. So this perverse logic is now being pushed forward and excuses the actions of the security forces that also represent that collective Putin um, as, a, as, as a state. But do people believe that? I mean, uh, is there still a part in the Russian population who now thinks that man is paid by the CIA or by Angela Merkel? No, I, mean, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't think that, the, but, but the thing about propaganda is you know very well, I mean, you're a journalist, so you probably deal with it uh, a lot writing about all sorts of all sorts of things. I mean, with propaganda, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. What matters is it justifies your actions. And if it justifies your actions, who cares what people believe in it? Uh, for example, there is a, uh, the spokesperson for the Kremlin uh, came out, I think today and said, uh, we are not an oppressive state. So what's the reason it was after the complaints that people are sitting in, in, uh, in those cold buses for hours uh, and that is, an, and, and this is really a human rights abuse, and it's a clear human rights abuse. So, what are these? They should be kind of the part of the convention, right? They're part of uh, uh, the Council of Europe. So, all these things should be taken into consideration. So, what's the Kremlin argument back? Is that uh, they, well, what should be concentrated on is not the fact that they were mistreated. Uh, or so many people were caught, or so many people were arrested, but that the people who were arrested, uh, they, um, they violated law by going into the streets because it was forbidden. Mm -hmm. So you have this absolutely perverse logic, a very Soviet kind, I mean, that's why I kept bringing up the 1937, is that there is a state logic that doesn't have to be believed. And that is also a very new thing because the Putin state, when Putin, not collective Putin, but Putin, Putin was, sort of in charge of it, or at least there were some tactical ideas that probably were presented from, from the top. He was very attuned to kind of public response to him. There is no longer such thing. So there is a, uh, so there was, right, he's the, the, the public response. It's either if they are not for the state that must be there against the state, which is a very Stalinist uh, Stalinist logic. So for the people, they may not be believing that uh, that Navalny is a CIA. I mean, I'm sure they're not believing that Navalny is a CIA, but he's a little bit of a showboat. And, you know, sometimes people don't like that. So that also goes slightly against his personality. But another thing, and that is also very clever. I mean, I, I'm probably one of the few people who say that the state is not that idiotic as we now portray him, portray it, is that, you know, when you close the whole center of Moscow with everything on weekends, that means that people can't do anything. And a lot of people actually come there to go shopping to major stores. So go one weekend, go two weekend, go three weekend. On the fourth weekend, it's like, you know what? That's inconvenient. I actually really resent the fact that every subway station around the Kremlin is closed. I need it to be open. So that's another part of how they manipulate the public. It's not, CIA is just, Kind of, they need to do it, but also making in, making it inconvenient and then blame Navalny for it. That's that's an effective tactic. Well, what I I had um, uh, an interview um, with uh, Leonid Volkov, his second man in command, who now is sort of organizing the protests and in the regions also, and also all the political campaign. And he was say, saying they are not trying to push people now for precisely this reason to ongoing protests, because you cannot just continuously protest, uh, especially not so well in January, February, and sort of the opening shots around the, the, the trial and the arrest of Navalny have now been done, and they are regrouping now. And I'm just wondering, 
you know, the sad thing about a state like uh, Putin's state now is that, or the collective Putinist state, we have seen this in Belorussia, where where the where Lukashenko is a lot less strong than than Putin and his men are in Moscow, but still they can repress these protests for months and months, and you are not sure that you can bring these guys down before people lose energy to actually do that. And so I'm wondering if, um, you know, if we can, you know, put in, and these guys sit maybe in the Kremlin now and they just dismisses, dismiss the thing as they always have done and said like, these are clowns, these are sort of, you know, drawing hearts, ha ha ha, this is not gonna cut it. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, absolutely. I mean, as, as Mikhail Gorbachev said, would, would say, I mean, or said, uh, used to say in your question, there is an answer, absolutely. Uh, though I do want to, in fact, kind of defend Putin versus Lukashenko in, in a weird way. Uh, certainly the Russian state is much stronger than the Russian state, but Lukashenko was dictatorial and also Soviet dictatorial long before Putin was even an entity. And in fact, until not rather recently, but certainly gradually, uh, Putin became Lukashenko-like. And this is actually, this is the first protest that reminds me of Belarus. So the Russians learned from Belarus. For example, they never jammed. And I think you and I had this conversation earlier that uh, the Belarus protests, uh, they were taking kind of clues, clues from uh, China in Hong Kong when they would be jamming the internet. Uh, and uh, the Russians never jammed the internet before. I mean, they did a little bit, but you always could post and communicate yeah. and whatnot. So Belarus did it and now the Russians did it. Because I remember when I was looking at Belarusian protests and I was just there slightly before the protest happened is that how exactly Soviet they were in a sense that it was an absolute complete brute force, which Russians really did not display until this time around. So yes, I think we are going to follow that Belarusian model rather than Belarus was following the Russian model here is that they would be um, people, people like me and you know many more people who are um, kind of better and more heroic go to the streets every weekend whenever they find out and just be there and you know scream Putin is a thief and you know free mm -hmm. Navalny and whatnot. And so that would become an everyday or every week thing for uh, for the state, the way Belarus is, it doesn't mean, as in Belarus, that the state is going to collapse tomorrow. I mean, yes, I mean, protests. And as I said, in 2012, it seemed like Putin was going to fall down that very second, and he didn't. Uh, and he was very clever because at the time it was not a collective Putin, it was actually Putin Putin. So what did he offer the Russians so they would stop shouting? He offered them Crimea and that was incredibly successful. It was a brilliant move. The problem now is that first of all, there's you know six years. So there's much more Putin fatigue. He's much more godlike than he was in 2014. And there is no more Crimea. There's just what, I mean, I think the only thing that can kind of bring people um, kind of get excited is, I don't know what, what will. I mean, Belarus, if they take Belarus, it's not going to do anything. Nobody cares. And Lukashenko is already his man. So there's really no place that the Russians can take in order to invigorate the very ossified system. And so I think what we are facing is an inter, I mean, I, I actually don't know where it's going to go. I can't predict, but um, so, 1917, the time of troubles, the ossified system, the collective czar, because the czar himself was not performing his duties, goes off Bolshevik revolution regime change. In 1991, um, uh, Gorbachev was not protecting the collective uh, Soviet state, the hardline coup, uh, the system changes in 91. I mean, you know, we can go back into history. It's, you know, Russian history is filled with those. We can talk about the original time of troubles, uh, the end of uh, six, 1500s when the Rurik dynasty, the first Russian dynasty turned into the Romanov dynasty. So it seems like it is this kind of time, whether it will end up being this kind of time, I don't know. But I do think, you know, from my kind of, Russian politics and history studies that when the collective state um, 
becomes the defender of the state formula, it really ultimately or soon enough, it does need to collapse. Yeah. I mean, it's, I got an, an, uh, a message today from a Russian friend and he said, everyone is looking at this now at three dates, 1917, 1937, 1953. We all want it to be 1953, the death of Stalin. <laughs> and I thought like, yes, of course. I mean, you know, if, if sort of the, um, if especially if the unwanted leader dies, in his next to his desk in his in his office, uh, it's, it's not. Uh, you don't need a bloody revolution. Right. So that's a very good luck. It really, I mean, you know, we all. It only happens in you know midsummer murders, one of those British procedurals. It just doesn't happen. Um, but also, you know, let's think of 1964 because that's another thing that kind of because there's a lot of random explanation, not random, but kind of almost tea leaf explanations as to why it's happening the way it's happening. Because of course, you know, and that's why I actually offered that that explanation, which is when the state is not entirely needy, yeah. it has some reason. But that's just one of those that are available because another available and maybe the state is an idiot and is that incompetent and Putin did go mad. Uh, and is that terrified of Navalny? And something that you um, um, kind of announced, and I think in, tw in a Twitter is that, uh, and if that's the case, then, then uh, Navalny is Putin's Trotsky. So as Joseph Stalin uh, was so terrified of kind of the, the power of, of, of Trotsky, which also, by the way, like Navalny had a global reputation unlike Stalin who did not. Uh, and so if Navalny is Tro Putin's Trotsky, then they can do whatever. But it also means that, you know, the, 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 he's a cretin who just lost uh, any mind and any potential to think clearly. So that's one version, but it's too simplistic. I, I just, I what? really think it's too simplistic. Uh, but there is another version with this is that he's being, that is all being done in order to have a quiet revolution. And so let's add another number, 1964, when Nikita Khrushchev was dismissed. It was kind of the same. I mean, they got really sick and tired of his changes here and there and everywhere, and they took him out. It was not a bloody revolution, but it's possible. So it is another kind of potential it revolution. Was not a, it was not a good one. It, that was not a good um, well, it wasn't I, bloody. I mean, look, in Russian history, when it's not bloody, it's not a bad one either. Yeah, that's true. Some of our um, viewers might know that, but of course, uh, Khrushchev and is your grandfather, and you are not uh, not by, by chance or by accident called by the same name. But uh, if you look at this um, uh, revolutionary moments in Russian history, because I, I, I find it very interesting. If you look at the Navalny movement, this is, uh, they are not, they don't look for a revolution, uh, like a, a, an abrupt bloody overthrow of the Putin regime, not at all. I mean, I mentioned yesterday morning in an interview with the sort of general director of, uh, of the uh, Anti-Corruption Foundation, uh, Vladimir Azhurkov, who sits here in London, actually, um, uh, if, if this is a revolutionary moment. And he said, no revolution, no revolution. We don't want a revolution. We want democracy. Because, of course, in the collective um, memory of uh, Russians, 1917 is not a positive um, uh, moment, is not the switch from Tsarism to a uh, republic. It was sort of not a democratic event and it is not positively seen. And so I wonder if this is, if we can describe this moment, as you say, maybe with 1964, but in terms of a populist, a popular uprising, it's more like the revolutions, the citizens' revolutions of 1848 um, in Europe more than the like French revolutionary moment of 1789. Well, we're not in Europe, so <laughs> that's um, so we rarely, as I said, that's why I said that we may think that Khrushchev's dismissal was not a good thing, and it wasn't a good thing, of course. And I certainly, you know, for family reasons and political reasons, don't think it was a good thing. But comparing to what Russian history is, it was a good thing, the same way that 19, 1991 ultimately was a good thing and Gorbachev lost his power, but 
um, uh, the, the change happened with a popular uprising. In fact, it's interesting that they don't want a revolution, the, uh, the corruption. I mean, I knew that they didn't want a revolution, but they understand it's good that they understand that revolution is such a scary word uh, in, in Russia because Putin also doesn't like revolutions. And in fact, uh, I think go back to my point is that there is a, um, there is a um, logic to the madness, the way they are oppressing this right now is exactly that. They're presenting it as a revolutionary movement. And so as a revolutionary movement, that is all against, against you people. Uh, unfortunately, unlike in Europe, Russia has very few um, uh, kind of directions of this. I mean, we really, our change doesn't happen. I mean, we are not an evolutionary country. I mean, that's just by definition, historically, it's not an evolutionary country. It's a revolutionary country. Things change, kind of evolutionarized by, by the revolution. We, I hope we can escape the revolutionary road because from st after nine, I mean, after 64, which was a bad political change and was not a welcome political change, but it was in the Russian framework, actually Khrushchev himself, when he was, uh, he was voted out of power, he said, my greatest achievement today that I was dismissed by mere voting because of course only 10 years before he would not have been. Mm -hmm. So then 91, yes, there were tanks in the street, but it really collapsed rather peacefully. I mean, the Soviet Union collapsed rather peacefully. So my hope that we can continue that trajectory, but uh, to say that uh, we kind of, we are certainly going to escape, um, uh, to escape other possibilities that are not as peaceful. That is also, we cannot say because Prague Spring is really a random thing for us. It's not, <laughs> it's not a regular thing for us. It's more, it's more of an exception, but we'll see, because I do think that at this point, um, you know, Putin, Putin collective, uh, collective Putin, it is really an ossified, um, an ossified body that really cannot offer anything to the public. Well, and this is what became so obvious in the last months also. You have the feeling you have uh, in Navalny, and, and not only in Navalny, but this entire movement around him are, uh, is a new generation of Russians uh, in the political sphere. And it's, it's, the, the regime looks incredibly old next to these witty, smart guys who are fast moving on the on the all social social media um, channels, if it's uh, Instagram or if it's the YouTube videos that they produce, which are full of a sense of humor, which is so Russian also. And that's the interesting thing also. They are not copies of some kind of American um, idea of uh, political anything. They are sort of a very genuine Russian, very sort of proud Russian, very sort of by themselves, but very, very contemporary and modern. So this is uh, maybe not enough to let Putin's regime collapse, but they, somehow I, I'm thinking Putin and his guys have to come up with something and not only brute force because they they just sort of vote themselves out by being so incredibly boring well but the, and i think that's usually you know somebody mentioned 1953 i mean by that by then the yeah. stalin regime was completely was totally um uh, lost all the blood i mean it sucked the blood out of the people and completely it was completely bloodless as it is its own body uh, and so in, in many ways, we are in a similar situation right now. I mean, I would say 53 because 53 was a, kind of almost the lucky thing that happened, although um, I don't want to say any that luck is, is somebody's death. But in many ways, for me, this is more the um, kind of 1980s before, uh, before and right after when Gorbachev came in, when uh, the regime was also... I mean, it had no life. It was completely geriatric uh, with absolutely nothing to offer. It seemed like it would be forever and then it wasn't forever and, you know, all this. Uh, so it, for me, that is a little bit more of a, a similarity right now. They do have to come up with something and, and Russians are incredibly creative. I mean, I don't think, I mean, as you say, they're not copies. Russians are 
imitative. I mean, Russia is an imitative imitation culture. It doesn't really invent the original stuff, but the minute it appropriates the original stuff from the West, then it makes it completely Russian. And then it just really, it's like Dostoevsky. Then suddenly he's the greatest writer there is. Although of course the formulas, the original formulas are very Western. Um, so in this sense, I mean, Russia is a European culture that kind of always fights with being one. Um, and um, so yes, and I think that's what Navalny also put to the focus is that he showed the oldness of the regime and what the new is. And I think that also brought this 50% of people who never demonstrated before, brought them to the streets precisely because um, they are looking for, uh, for, for the new Russia that they've been talked yeah. about all the time. Yeah. But I also wonder if, you know, in Navalny itself, who started more on the right side of the political spectrum, quite nationalist, partly racist uh, in its beginnings, uh, he sort of went beyond this for a long time now already, but he could, he's definitely not sort of a classic lefty who goes against, uh, on the barricades um, against a, a, a regime that is oppressive. And I wonder if this is sort of also why he's so successful because Russia in general is a rather conservative society and Navalny ticks a lot of these boxes of being sort of macho man, but being also a very clearly uh, family father and loving husband and these kind of things. He's very patriotic if you want, if you want the positive spin to this, the, the Russia idea itself, that's also why he had to of course come back because it was clear that he couldn't stay away because he needs to be in to fight his fight on the on the ground. But there is that sort of also a kind of modern type of Russian politician where the old left and right um, coordinates don't work anymore and everyone can basically align behind him because it's all now everyone who is for putin is uh, wants to get rid of everyone who is for navalny is the one who wants to get rid of putin yeah no i mean i uh, you just answered the, your own question you basically said exactly what i would have said if i answered it is that precisely because he's not that left liberal um western liberal politician uh, and does want, I mean, it, you know, his slogan, earlier slogans were Russia for the Russians and Russia first and whatnot. He hasn't done it for a long time and, you know, good for him. And I don't even know whether he still believes it or not. I think he has enough. I mean, you know, people believe in different things and then they grow up or develop or read more books. Um, but it's certainly, he be precisely that. He's not that um, kind of, politician who wants Russia to be the West. He's a politician who wants strong Russia for the Russians without corruption, but with a self, with a sense of self-respect and, uh, um, and understanding of its own history, but not propaganda history. Mm -hmm. So it does seem um, exactly as you said. I mean, before we open for questions a little bit uh, to our viewers, I wanted to uh, go to one more subject because it's for me always interesting how we discuss sitting in Western Europe, uh, how we can help, how the European Union governments can help. So there's a lot of talk about sanctions. There's a lot of talk about Germany completing Nord Stream 2 and doing business with Putin while he puts his opposition leader in prison and what people should do. And uh, what is your understanding of that? What would be the best way for Western governments now to approach this um, a little bit old looking regime, but the man is elected and he is in the Kremlin. How can Angela Merkel now deal with that, for example? Well, I think you lost your chance. I mean, you probably had a chance and you lost it. So I'm, I'm actually go, not going to be sugarcoating this. I mean, you, you can't do any, you West, the West cannot do anything. And there were opportunities. And in fact, I would, you know, I'm not a fan of Mr. Putin, but I wouldn't just also blame, uh, put blame all on him because he was trying. And we talked at the Kreisky Forum about this numerous times in 2000, he was, saying we're not afraid of NATO, we're a Western country, we're European country, then NATO got expanded, he got slightly 
um, he got slightly right. um, kind of peeved, yes, but he was still willing to deal with it. But you know, that's the problem with the West is that, and I'm sorry if I sound like a Russian nationalist, which I hope I'm not, uh, but you know, Western Europe, I particularly, I mean, I live in the United States, they, I don't want to say you because it's too insulting, but they look down at everything. You know, we're quite white and we are white, but we are white, but not quite. Is that, you know, kind of a second rate country that doesn't really uphold the Western values and Anglo-Saxon manners and evolutionary linear thinking and so on and so forth. And so it always, it often comes through in, in, in dealing and development. And Putin is a clever man. And so he, and he's also a small man. He's a man with a chip on his shoulder so he counts those uh, insights and insecurities absolutely and he documents them and then he pushes them back so to say you know what can you do and you could find more sanctions but they if they were afraid of sanctions they wouldn't be doing what they're doing they're absolutely not afraid of them because it's like you already sanctioned 90 percent what can you do mm -hmm. uh, you can't but uh, since you mentioned North Nord Stream too is that uh, one of the things that I, I'm always puzzled by this, and I was puzzled by this more even because I know American politics better, when Barack Obama came to Putin in, in 2013 because he had a red line in Syria with the chemical weapons, but then he was afraid to use the red line, so he went to Putin to make sure that Putin kind of smoothes his way with uh, Bashar al-Assad. If you come to Putin with a favor, you absolutely should know you're going to pay. He, he, you will have to pay it back. So when you are making an agreement about Nord Stream two, you know that something is going to happen. So don't have a Nord Stream two. Don't even put yourself in that position. And I think the fact that the West is hypocritical uh, has superiority complex towards the Russians and other things too. But Russians particularly because we're white, but not quite. And at the same time lectures it and tells it that, you know, we uphold the values, but you do not. And yet the West also does not uphold the, well, the values. It actually plays into Putin's hand all the time. And the fact that he was blamed for everything, like for example, the Sputin, Sputnik, Sputnik vaccine was malign. And now it turns out that it's, it's not like, maybe at the beginning, don't say that it was a horrible experiment before you actually know it's a horrible experiment. And so this thing, Thing really um, very much um, kind of reduces the Western influence that it could have had on Russia. It's probably also now a little bit too late to um, to go back to like That's what I said. Yeah, it's too late. Things are really spoiled now. Also, the Nord Stream project, of course, cannot be stopped anymore at the last thirty kilometers. And also, the opposition. Um, everyone I spoke to in the last weeks were not asking for it because they say, you know, we cannot ask Western governments not to stop uh, cooperating in economic uh, ways with the Russian uh, government and that would also harm, it would harm the population if there are more sanctions that are general sanctions. They are all saying basically have these personalized sanctions against people who are all around uh, Putin who are directly responsible for what is going on and prevent them from sort of partying in the south of France. But they already, I mean, you know, who is who is not sanctions? I mean, basically almost everybody is now sanctioned. Yes, they can take uh, they can take Chelsea football team from Abramovich, fine, okay. But I mean, I am actually, I think that Nord Stream should be, because the, as long as Nord Stream continues, Putin thinks, or the collective Putin thinks it can do whatever, because it says, well, we have economic ties, we have economic interests, you're not going to go full way. Um, so, but I, I do think that, you know, we would say Putin is a tactician, he's not a strategy, I mean, there is no such thing as Putin as a tactician, anymore because it's a collective Putin, but used to say Putin is a tactician, even if he's not a strategist. I think the West was, has been incredibly badly strategizing about around Russia. First, it you know, kind of it insulted it when it needed to, and then tried to make amends when it doesn't, yeah. as if Russian point of view and Russian national interests do not exist. And I think that's the biggest problem since forever, and certainly uh, in the Cold War, in the post-Cold War environment. It's quite interesting. I mean, you don't, you certainly don't sound like a, nas a Russian nationalist. Um, but 
I wonder if you underestimate also the differences between the different European nations, for example, in dealing with Russia, because my uh, here in London, the, the British government, there's a lot of pretty harsh political opinions on Putin uh, being um, uttered and also because people were dying on the streets of London by the hands of FSB uh, agents like uh, Sergei Skripal, uh, but also Skripal Alexander Lipin. Didn't die. Skripal Sorry. didn't die. Sorry, they were sort of an attempted uh, coordinate. Uh, but uh, 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 there were like 15 people who did die. And the first one of those was Alexander Litvinenko. Um, and that was all a question of sort of uh, a buildup in the British uh, public opinion, which was also at the same time always very friendly to Russia yeah. because, you know, it's a big country. It's not that people were actually. I don't know if people were looking down to the Russians or to Russia as such. Maybe some people had uh, at the beginning of the 90s the feeling that was a very American thing to export the American capitalism to Russia. The European nations were, I think, a bit more kinder in the way they, they looked at it. And they saw the Russians partly, uh, you know, as a stretch in Eastern Europe, also for a chance for real freedom for everyone. Maybe. Oh, but that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly what I said. I said, I don't want to speak to kind of a collective West because the yeah. collective West doesn't really, maybe in the Cold War it did, but that's why I immediately said that I refer more to the Anglo-Saxon formulas and the American formulas before. I, I, you're absolutely right. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not an expert on Europe. I'm not an expert on dealing with, uh, with uh, uh, of your, on, on European politics. Uh, but, you know, when America leads in this kind of approach to Russia, Europe follows. And I would say that some, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't always has to. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's true. Um, Jutta, I, I see a question here on the chat thing. Do you have, do you want to collect questions and can we look into this a little bit? Um, yes, so far there are no questions on Facebook, so for all the viewers on Facebook, you can ask your questions in the comment section on Facebook, and I will give them to Nina and Tessa, and I think until then we can work with the questions soon. And we have one here from William saying, oil and gas are not the future, but oil and gas are all Putin has. His theory is Putinism ends when the oil and gas runs out. Is that uh, something he should? Okay, I found this on the web for his ooh, feudalism. Ooh, ooh. Um, is that something, Nina, that could happen? That um, that his whole wealth will just stop, and he has to go. Well, yes, but you know, it's a long way away. Uh, and I remember actually I was at the Kreisky Forum, it was 2008, and I wrote an article about this: is that when oil and gas <laughs> runs, runs out, what it was. What is, going, what, is Russia, what is Russia going to do? It has been 12 years. It hasn't run out. We have Nord Stream too. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, to Russia's credit, at least some credit, uh, it has diversified more since 2008. Uh, it really, uh, more than it ever was, it's really an economy of services, which of course suffered in COVID, but probably less than in other places because they didn't do the shutdown um, as much. So. Russia has something to offer, but precisely because there is an ossified state, uh, for example, all the technology, uh, you know, the Sputnik vaccine, there are incredible inventions in scientific inventions in, uh, uh, in the city of, Novos of Novosibirsk. But the problem is that there are inventions in this great Russian ingenuity, but at the same time, there's fear that they would take too much freedom in doing whatever it is they're doing. So one arm of Russia wants to develop and show that Russia is a great country that can do things, but another arm is wanting to restrict it. And I think that's a bigger problem than the fact that Russia will drown, uh, run out of oil and gas. It's the problem is that it's going to, or it has been and will more restrict its own opportunities. 
I mean, the, the whole talk about the collective Putin, if you, there, he has been trying for years now to put his uh, son-in-laws in strategic positions. Problem is the son-in-laws don't always work well as family members, so that's a side problem. Uh, but sort of his cronies are sitting in all the big corporations. Uh, the, the, the state is basically the owner of all the big companies and oil and energy uh, companies, again, as it was before the whole democratic change. Mm, how strong is this collective Putin, in fact, in terms of being so connected economy and state that it will be very difficult to unravel this whole thing? Well, it's, I mean, it's, I don't think it's even, it is, but it's more than collective Putin, it's more than just Putin's family or yeah. uh, his oligarchs. On the other hand, we do have this amazing, I mean, it's not amazing for the Russians, it's just absurd. It's very Gogolian, as if it came out of a Gogol's play, which of course would be written in 1830 or something, which is, you know, more than 200 years ago. Uh, but uh, for example, the Putin palace, uh, all this comes out and, you know, all these rooms and it's all luxurious and whatnot, and of course, uh, probably taken down as um, uh, uh, people suggested, uh, taken out as a Berlusconi copy uh, that, that his yeah. palace was like that and Putin is a friend and whatnot, possibly. And so to the, Putin says it's nothing to do with that. He doesn't know it has been going on for 10 years, nothing to do with him. Then one of his oligarchs, Rottenberg, comes out and says, oh, but it's just mine. And, you know, it's all done for me. He's like, wait a minute, but we know that you are Putin's banker. So if you yeah. say it's your palace, it is a Putin palace. And I find this a remarkably interesting sort of, on one hand, they deny. On the other hand, they don't even bother for you to believe. It's just, you wanted an answer. Remember what you mentioned this poisoning. So in Salisbury, uh, the poisoning yes. happened then the two guys were caught or, or kind of identified. Then they go out on TV and give some completely insane story that they were looking at the cathedral. And then of course, nobody believes them. But the whole point is like, you wanted, you wanted an answer, here is the answer. If you don't believe it, go to hell. And the same thing with this. So the, the collective Putin is also incredibly brazen formula, a brazen, for, so brazen formula of, of uh, this kind of yeah. corruption and nepotism. But it doesn't mean that, um, uh, that it cannot, so that's why the collective Putin, not only in the security forces, but also in, in, other, in, in, in other positions has to, do, has, to, um, uh, has to defend the collective Putin. They also can turn against Putin personal and, def and say, he just went crazy, but it's all going to be better now. Kind of like Brezhnev when he came after Khrushchev, he said, no, we're just, Cuban Missile Crisis is not going to happen anymore. We're going to embrace you. We're going to have good politics and whatnot. So it is the collective, the collective Putin may remain, but the Putin at its head will have a different, uh, different formula, different personality. We have here from Konrad Roske a question. How do you think the future of Navalny will look like? Does he get a constitutional trial? No, right. Well, he already didn't get one. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's Russia, so there are three potential. Unfortunately, there's never a decision. They can decide that, you know, they, sh they taught him a lesson and he's going to be put into house arrest. I mean, this is just a kind of a wishful thinking, but it is possible. It happened before. It happened with other oppositional leaders. He can sit there for his two our two years and eight months. And in the meantime, they're gonna build another case for him because for now he's sitting there for violating parole, so to speak. But they can build a case that he defrauded the his foundation, the anti-corruption foundation, which they already saying he has, he probably has defrauded. So that that is the case that I expect them to start building. And that I think, I mean, I can be wrong and I'm not saying I'm 100% sure, but sort of thinking about this. So they will build another case and give him another 10 years because until they figure out what to do with a Putin and not collective Putin, but Putin, Putin, uh, they would want Navalny out of sight. Yeah, so he might not get out for years to come. I hope he will, but I, you know, you can't, you can't really predict this. 
and do you think it will the 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 movement will be strong enough then to carry on or will this be sort of an event like 2011 12 when it floated away all this um energy for democratic change and needed another 10 years till now to come back up well i think 2012 was it's also i mean let's it did i mean it, the protests were happening for two years uh so it wasn't it wasn't just floating away but then crimea happened and then it really changed it changed the um the equilibrium right right there and then um i don't know i mean i People may get tired, and I'm sure. I mean, in Belarus, we already see less protests, but it doesn't mean that they're not going to come back or they're not going to continue. Even if there are less people, they're still going to continue. So I don't think that is going to go away. Uh, but also, I mean, we go back to the revolutions, and you know, what time is it in Russia? Uh, 19, 1917. Let's remember that uh, the Tsarist regime put in prison or exiled every single opposition leader or every single leader of the Bolsheviks and, and, and Mensheviks and anybody who existed as a non-monarchist in uh, uh, before 1917. It didn't stop the revolution. So when, uh, when this time of troubles kind of exhausted its potential, the change has to come. And so I think that as political scientists, political analysts, we cannot predict that. But we can suggest that history tells us that uh, this is likelier the end of the regime rather than, uh, although it can, the end can continue for some time, the end of the regime rather than just a bridge to something similar. I have a, we are out of time now, but I have uh, an anonymous question here in the chat where I have to say I'm always so sad when people send us anonymous questions and not tell us who they actually are and what their name is. Um, but this is someone who uh, asks um, why, especially me, why uh, we think that the Russian regime should step down. I can answer this briefly and say, like, I think they closed down the democratic institutions. And I think this is very bad for Russia and the Russian population. But maybe, Nina, you want to have the final word on this. Why do we need change in Russia? And is Navalny the hope that should continue being a hope for the democratic opposition? Well, I think the regime needs to change. It needs new blood. I mean, four years, I mean, I have a lot of criticism of, of an American system, but I think four years, uh, six years probably uh, in, uh, uh, in the position of top power is, is a very good idea. And then you have to get reelected because people get, once again, I mean, I keep repeating this word, but that's what I'm thinking about today's system. It's incredibly ossified. It cannot renew itself. It repeats mistakes that it has already made. It cannot offer any future opportunities. As I said, my niece is 20 years old. She, she said, I was born, I was born <laughs> under Putin. I don't want to under Putin. And I mean, I think it's, and it's a reason enough whether Navalny, and Navalny is a catalyst of this. I don't think he's going to be next president. I don't even think that anybody really quite expect him to be next president, but he's that leader who was able to bring or to foster, uh, uh, to foster change. And I think we welcome that. I think this was a very good final word. We will be back for the next round of the Russian roulette between those two men, probably quite soon. Um, stay safe, please. Although stay safe is now something for all of us to say wherever we are. This is what the pandemic did to us, that basically we all need to stay safe in the East and in the West. And thank you very, very much for thank taking you. the time for this talk today. And I hope um, for everyone that um, we see each other very, very soon again. Thank you, Kreisky Forum, and thank you, Tessa. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.